The following episode contains graphic language and content, which some listeners may find disturbing. It is intended for a mature audience only. Listener discretion is advised. This is part two of Shamsa's story, where she details her uncomfortable experiences with forced marriage and sexual assault upon returning to Somalia, and her painful but eventual escape back to the UK. So, Shamsa, you were living in the UK and you wanted to reintegrate with your cultural roots, so you went back to Somalia. Tell us what happened there. Whilst I was there, a few months of being there, I was forced to get married to my cousin, who at the time was two years younger than me, from what I've been told. However, a lot of people don't know the actions of their children, and there is no way on God's green earth that that man was a child. Just, there's just no way. that He was younger than me, for sure. Um, not just body wise, he looked like he goes to the gym. <laughs> so I know by now that if you mix um, DNA that is so close together, that in some cases you're going to have a child with some sort of disability. And I just couldn't imagine that. And um, I said, no, I'm not, I can't do it. But my word wasn't taken. I was beaten, threatened had my phone confiscated, my mother manipulated until I didn't agree, but I did, if that makes any sense. So out of at the time there was a terrorist organization living in Somalia and they are called Al Shabaab. They're quite similar to ISIS. And I remember watching them cut somebody's hand off. And from that day on, I just, I had this uncontrollable, uncontrollable fear of them. And um, he, my uncle would say things like, oh, I'm going to call Al-Shabaab to get you arrested and you will be imprisoned for three months for not obeying your parents. I had to, in a way, agree and say, okay, 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 okay. I get a call one day from my father. And he says, oh, you know, congratulations, you're a married woman now. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And he's like, you're, you're married now. And I said, how? So there was no ceremony or there was no celebration of sorts? No, there was. There was after. But when you're having the meher, the actual ceremony where you are officially married in the eyes of Islam, in order for that to be valid, the sheikh who is performing that ceremony would have to call me and ask if I want this marriage, if I consented to it, if I am happy with it. But I was never given that chance because they knew that I was going to probably say no. So they called my father and said, oh, your daughter wants this. Um, and I was just given up just like that. But a week before, I this thought came into my head like, shit, okay, these people are actually going to force me to get married. But because I started tearing when I was 14 years old, I thought if he, if he sees that I'm open, then he's going to think that I had had sex previously. And maybe that's the reason why she's in this country to be recultured. You know, she was a whore. <laughs> and I thought I like that because I knew that I would either be stoned to death or be whipped like a hundred times. And neither of which I was ready to, to do, um, especially being stoned to death. And that was very common with Al-Shabaab. They love to do that. So I got really scared and I went to my uncle's wife and I said, this is what's happened. This is the reason why it happened. And she goes, she didn't, I don't think she believed me. So she took me to a cutter where I was examined and she confirmed that um, what the doctor said could have been true because um, there are some cases where if the period has nowhere to come out from, it will physically tear uh, through the skin to find a way out. So she turns to me and she's like, but do you want me to redo you? Resew you? 
I said, did you just confirm that I'm a virgin? I said, thank you so much. Um, have a great day. I'll see you later. As long as I had that confirmation, I was fine. Because then my life wasn't actually at risk in terms of in terms of terrorism. And then a week later is when I find out that uh, on my wedding day, that it was my wedding day. Fast forward, I was put into a room, which I had to stay in for seven days, by the way. It's like the honeymoon stage. You're not allowed to come out unless you're showering or getting ready for prayer. I was there thinking, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? But I couldn't think of anything because the family were just outside. I can't run away. I knew what sex was, but I didn't have a lot of knowledge about it. He comes into the room wearing uh, something we call ma'awis. It's like a, a cloth that they wrap around their waist and then like, tuck it in. So it's just put. The moment he walked through the door, he already had his hand on his waist, you know, the skirt. And um, he just dropped it. It like stood right in front of me because I was looking at a mirror, <laughs> looking at myself, thinking, what is my life? And I genuinely didn't know whether to laugh or cry because it was so ridiculous. I panicked and I thought, oh my God, okay, like what can I say now to get him to wait? Um, and then I thought, oh, I have pins, so many pins in my head because of the star that they pinned up. So I said, can you please help me remove these pins? He goes behind and starts removing these 101 pins. And whilst he's doing it, I'm still trying to find a way out. And then I thought, well, there is no way out. And now you have two choices, either submit or get raped. So I thought, out of those two choices, what are you going to do? So I picked submission so I was like no 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 I'll do it this way so that then it'll be more at least like gentle a lot of karma but I found myself trying to find a position that can ease the pain because it shit was painful when I couldn't take it anymore I was already in a compromising position and I said no get off me I'm done I can't be up the pain overtook my body the hole was so small even though I was physically teared but it wasn't enough for penetration he kept me down with his weight it was too much he raped me <laughs> that was my first sexual experience violent rape and I ended up tearing, bleeding, and I was in absolute agony. My body was in shock. After a few hits, it was just, my body went numb and no thought would enter my mind. It was as if nothing about me existed anymore. And when he was done, he just turned around, went to bed and I cried myself to sleep. It happened again for the next three to four days. And then at some point on the fourth day, I was like, if you fucking touch me, I will kill you and I will happily die in the hands of Al-Shabaab. Happily. Don't touch me. Because on the fourth day, I discovered that because of the trauma that he caused, I was unable to urinate. When the seven day was finished, my uncle decided to kick me out of the house. The moment we moved, the rape continued. But by this time, it felt like it was a duty. I, it just had to be done. So I just laid there, did what he did, he wanted to do, and he just got off. There was nothing that I could say or do. And if I fought it more, then I would just be violently raped and I would not be able to function tomorrow. I left the house. I went to my granddad, my grandma's brother, and I said, I'm not fucking doing this. I'm not doing it. I told them I did not come all the way from England to be forced to get married and now to have to be beaten because I didn't tell my family about the rape. We have a shaming culture 
there is certain things that you cannot talk about. If they believe that you're in a marriage here, they call it marital rape. Marital rape doesn't exist. That's your husband, your property of your husband, like his keys, the car, his car, his house. So he will use you and abuse you as much as he likes because he paid for you, basically. That's not Islam. But they weaponize the religion, manipulate it, and use it against uneducated women. I knew that that didn't make any sense. Even though I knew, I also knew that they were going to shame me regardless. And I just could not deal with so scared of Al-Shabaab as well. So I knew I couldn't utter those words to, to them. And uh, he said, well, you have two choices now. Is either I curse you or I bless you. And I'm like, curse me, please. And he started physically cracking up. And he's like, we Somalis believe that our elders, if they curse us or bless us, we will receive that curse or that blessing. It will stick. And he's like, I've been alive for this many years and I have had no one ever say, hey, I'll take the curse. And I said, well, I'll take it. And he's like, no, I'm not going to. Don't worry. I'll speak to him. Go back to your husband. He'll change. We'll, tell him, we'll speak to him. It'll never happen again. And I said to him, if it happens again, what are you going to do? And he was like, we won't let it happen again. The beating continued. Um, like the, on a daily, it was like the push and shove. I was locked up in the house. Um, from the kitchen, I had to climb the gate to get out. And there were four severe beatings. The first one was early in the morning. I really struggled with my period. Um, I could barely move. And then he comes into the, he was already in the room, but he left, came back in and basically said, get up and go get breakfast. It's five, six o'clock in the morning. So I said to him, why don't you go get the stuff that we need? And I'm happy to cook. He's like, no, get up and cook. And then I thought to myself, okay, you can't get beating right now at the <laughs> position that you are in. So get up. I'm forced, dragged myself to that market, bought the things that I needed. And I knew that my little cousins were coming to have breakfast with us that morning. So when I arrived, they were already there. And I forgot stock cube. So I asked one of my cousins to go to the shop and get it. And I put tea on, took that off you know, gave it to everybody, went back to the room. And I thought, let me lay down for a little bit whilst my cousin is away, um, you know, before he comes back. And I think I drifted off to sleep. And then I wake up to this man physically on top of me, like sat on my chest, um, legs on either side. And he's, the moment I opened my eyes, he started punching, but He's working his way down. So he started from my head, started punching my face, my neck, my chest, my stomach. And whilst he's doing that, he's moving down my body because he's on top of me. And then he gets off me, walks outside. So I took the secondhand shit furniture that my uncle bought me. I took all of that and I pinned it to the wall. And then 20 minutes later, I sat there thinking, okay, how... <laughs> First, how did you do this? And second, <laughs> how are you going to get him out? <laughs> you can't stay here forever. So I had to remove everything um, out of the door. Went next door to the neighbors and I said, give me your phone. So they gave me their phone. I called my mother and I said, is this what you wanted? And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, your family's forced me to marry this human. And I explained to her that I was to get married to this man that I was beaten I told my mom everything, even when my uncle said he's going to put my picture in every checkpoint from here to the capital. So there was no way for me to escape automatic imprisonment. So my mother said, OK, let me speak to the rest of uh, the family and I'll call you back. And I'm like, but I'm warning you right now. These people will lie to you. And um, she's like, don't do anything. Don't do put your life at risk. I got a call back and she said, that's exactly what they did. They lied told them that I was the bad one, that I was a liar, that I was exaggerating everything and that maybe I needed a beating or two. So she said, we're going to have to come up with a plan for you to escape. And because I didn't tell her about the rape, I told her that the beating has caused me a lot of pain and I need to go to the hospital. And we can use that as an excuse 
for me to actually leave. And I knew a girl at the hospital. So I went on the day that I'm leaving. My plan is to tell them that I'm coming to you. So it doesn't matter what time they come. When they can't find me, eventually they're going to come to you and say, you know, what time has she left? And my mother even said to me, even if you have to sleep with him to make it seem like everything is okay, she's like, do it. I understood what she meant. I have to basically make him feel like everything was fine. So the day came that I was leaving. I told him I'm going to the hospital, woke up, woke up super early, got ready. I booked a bus the day that I was leaving. I sat in the window passenger side and I will never forget whilst I was sat there, not the uncle, but his brother who was apparently had the closest links to Al-Shabaab. He walked right past the window that I was sat on. And when I saw the space, I swear to you, I pissed myself a little bit because I thought I am going to die. So he, he didn't see you because you were fully covered because you're wearing the niqab. Can you explain what you were wearing? Why couldn't he see you? He didn't look my way at all. He just literally just went past. So he didn't see me. He didn't look at the car. He didn't, we didn't make eye contact, nothing. I just recognized him and he walked past. And then I got to Mogadishu, which, which was controlled by the government. And I remember a few days later, I get a call. They have connections to terrorist organization. The terrorist organizations would go to the phone towers and they found my name because they keep records of the person and their number, right? Depending on the phone tower that you're using. The particular one that I was using, they found my contact information. So I get a call and my auntie picked up and she has the exact same name as me. So the person, he was like, oh, is it Shamsa? And she said, yeah, thinking that it was someone that was looking for her. And he goes, Watch when I find you. I'm going to put you in prison. You'll never see the light of day again. I'm going to make sure that you have a living miserable life and you don't ever leave. She listened to all of this bullshit. Yeah? <laughs> and then at the end, she was like, you're speaking to the wrong Shamsa. You're not speaking to the woman that you've been abusing. You're speaking to her auntie, the person who was named after her. So she goes, you can say all of this now. You can come up with all of these threats. But how about you put them to action and actually come to Mordisha, where we are? And she's like, we'll see then what you can do to her. And she's like, if you ever step foot in Mordisha, she goes, it will be the last, the last day you live on this planet. Oh, <gasps> wow. So, uh, sorry, how long did you end up staying then in Somalia for? How long did this whole thing happen? Like from you going back to Somalia to leaving Somalia? One year and... A month, maybe. It was a year of hell, <laughs> tell you that much. And that was a very eventful gap year for sure. And in Mogadishu, I was able to receive medical attention. I had about 24 antibiotic injections. Again, I think it was out of date. During the time that I was in Mogadishu with my aunties, there were another types of fear. So for example, there was a massive bombing whilst I was there. I was in the capital, not far from where the explosion took place. And it felt as if the ground that I stood on was no longer still. I levitated off the floor. I ended up in my older cousin's hand. There were bullets flying over our heads on a daily hearing this person got shot, this person got shot. And I'm like, okay, when is my turn? But my uncle, he had his leg blown off because he stepped on a mine that was hidden. He had a click the moment he took his foot off it and it carried him and put his leg on a tree. That's so scary. So they couldn't even get that. And it threw him on the other side and they had to bandage what was left of his leg and uh, try to relocate The other one, I don't know if they... But from then, I was like, okay, so now I can't even walk. Because if I walk... I I, I was walking very awkwardly after that. Because I'm trying to, like, see... (laughs) Like, wherever I try to put my foot down, I'm trying to, like, clean it just to see if there's anything there. But it was so nerve-wracking. 
And only after I returned, I realized that my mother during the time was. So, so when did you when did you leave? February the first. How how did that feel to like finally be free to be away from the country for that whole entire year where you were just abused and? It felt great. It felt absolutely amazing to be on an airplane. And but I did not feel safe until I actually came to UK soil and I touched UK soil and then I felt safe. Even on the aeroplane, I didn't feel safe. You know, I had to come back here to actually believe that I was back, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, I came back. Actually, whilst I was on the plane, I was told that my mother was actually diagnosed and was now dying of stage four cancer. Coming back, having to deal, having dealt with all of that, I had to then push all of that aside. The person that saved me was dying. Whilst in the process of saving me, she was dying. I also found out within that same day, February the 1st, 2012, that no one in my family, including my father, my brothers, my uncles, my nobody in my family wanted me to return. They all thought that my mother can die peacefully here and I can just be left there. And when I heard that, I remembered a conversation I had with my mother whilst I was in the show. I called her one day because I was really worried. I felt like something was off and no one was telling me. So she told everyone not to tell me, but she did warn me. She said to me, I need you to know that if I die whilst you're there, nobody in your family wants you back. You will also die there. They will not look back at you. They will not communicate with you. They will leave you to suffer. So she said, if you do come back, I want you to make something out of yourself. Prove to them that you are not the person that they think you are. I really didn't want to get emotional, but every time I speak about her, I do. I think what I, is really hard for me to comprehend is that she was warning me from my own family because she knew that um, none of them really gave a shit um, about me. And um, I only realized that what she said was right when I came back. And um, so I went to the hospital and seeing my mother for this first time, and because she had a brain tumor, her eyes were like a clock. It's ticking, tick, 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 back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I couldn't handle it. She just didn't look like my mother. She was losing hair, she had a hole in her throat, she wasn't speaking. And then this woman who was a close friend of my mother, who we used to play around with her children, the woman took me aside and she said, do you see that bed that your mom's laid in? I said, yes. She goes, you put her there. I was like, what? She goes, you put her there. It's because of you and the stress that you caused. That is the reason why your mother has a brain tumor. And that is the reason why she's laying on her deathbed. And as a 18 year old, I was turning 19 February 22. I believed it, I thought, because I told her about the abuse that I was facing, not the rape, but just the beating and the forced marriage and all of that. Her blood levels and her blood pressure and sugar levels went up. So she went to the NHS, told that she was told that she had a migraine, she's fine. <laughs> and then she didn't believe them, so she went to Germany to have a full checkup where she would pay 30,000 pounds just to discover that she had a brain tumor, an aggressive one at that. Seven days later, exactly seven days after arriving, 
my mother was taken to the hospice a few days after I arrived. But before she was taken to the hospice to die peacefully, the last person that she was concerned about and concerned for her safety and begging everybody on her deathbed to go get my child, go get my child, go bring my child. And a lot of people told me that I was the last person that she spoke about before she went silent, she went into a coma. And um, because of that, I knew that I had a responsibility to tell her and make you before she died that I was here because I didn't want her dying. I was worried. I didn't even know if she could think, but I thought maybe if she can, at least then she wouldn't, you know, think my child's gonna die there. And now that I'm a mom, I understand what it feels like. So I sat next to her like an hour. I was chanting, you know, I love you, please forgive me because of what that woman just said to me that I caused my mom to be in her deathbed. And she stopped moving her eyes. And it was the first time it happened since it started. And she looked directly at me. And I told her, you know, mommy, I'm here. I'm safe. I'm really sorry. Like, please forgive me. And then she started crying, like physically tearing up whilst her eyes completely still looking at me. And I thought to myself, what type of person are you? You know, to be making your mother cry on her deathbed. I didn't feel like it was fair. And I couldn't handle it, so I got up. And these women rushed towards me and my mom lost focus. So her eyes went back to ticking. And then she was moved to a hospice where she died. She was buried the next day. At my mom's funeral, I was told that I was responsible for her death by another family member. I was severely depressed for a very long time. And my whole entire family was against me. Each and every one of them, not one person, I felt like wanted something good from me. Apart from my beautiful auntie who I'm with today. Because I didn't have a family, I no longer had a mother. I felt as if I needed love. I needed support. And I married the first person that showed it to me. And honestly, it was out of desperation. It wasn't out of love. It wasn't out of sympathy. It was a lot to deal with in such a short space of time. It took me almost a year and a half to actually get a divorce from the man that I was never married to, my rapist. So I struggled with that. And I went to many religious leaders, uh, mosque leaders, Islamic leaders, and I explained everything that had happened to me, that he doesn't financially support me. I was sexually assaulted. I was beaten. I was basically tortured (laughs) and I had to escape and come back. And I said, I want to be married to this man. And they've all said the exact same thing. We need to hear his side of the story. And didn't take my sexual assault serious. They They didn't take my domestic violence serious. They didn't take anything that happened to me serious. So they failed me too. As a leader of a mosque, you have a responsibility, as you know, the rights of women in Islam, which are so much, by the way, more than any country in this world, more than any religion in this world. But it is not practiced. Why? Because the focus is men. Men, 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 men. Everything. You're going to go to heaven because of your husband. If he's not your husband, you're going to go to heaven because of your mother. You have to please your husband sexually. You can't focus on your own sexual pleasure. You have to do this cook for your husband. You have to clean for your husband. You have to. I started doubting my own religion. So I decided to research the rights of women in Islam and come to find out we are powerful fucking people. So in Islam, right. it's very important. She gives birth. She risks her life to bring a child into this world. 
So the level of respect for women in Islam is <laughs> crazy. However, they will not teach that part of Islam. They will not teach the rights of women in Islam. But what they will teach is the things that they can manipulate because these women lack education. So convincing hundreds of thousands, millions of women that FGM, female genital cutting, is acceptable. How do you do that? Because you use religion to get them to conform. You use religion so that it makes sense in their mind why you're doing what you're doing. And with FGM or FGC, religion is used often. You know, it's cleaner. Um, you know, the, the woman is expected to pray, so she can't have a clitoris. Well, why not? I thought you said God is great. I thought you said God does not make any mistakes. So when he created me, he just left the clitoris by accident. They are hypocrites. And honestly, I'm sick and tired of people focusing on the events that took place that caused the women to be traumatized. So, for example, with FGM, when they gave the name female genital mutilation, they wanted the practice to have such a horrendous name that people are going to want to stop. We, 200 million women, know exactly how horrendous it is. I don't need mutilation to tell me that the practice is so bad. I know it's bad because I went through it. No one really takes the time to see what it is that you need. I'll give you a great example. I had social services to my house and these are the children protection officers. And it was in the Netherlands. It wasn't in this country. When they realized that I voluntarily told them and I told each and every doctor, nurse, anybody who's ever examined me, nobody ever fucking noticed. Very unusual. So the midwife and at the hospital, they asked multiple times, girl, are you going to do it to your daughter? I went through hell and just stood there saying, are you going to do it to your child? How the hell do you think? Is that, is that saying to a rape victim, do you plan on raping your kid? Just because it happened to you. Because if you have a conversation with someone about the procedure, for example, you would see from their demeanor whether they agree with it or disagree, right? But without even having a conversation, without comforting that person, without providing them with services, if you sit there and say, are you going to do it to your kid? You know, we need to know. Then it becomes, I am now criminalized. So when I had the social room the second time, she said, oh, we're going to let social services know. But in my mind, I thought it wasn't for my daughter. It was for me. Like if I needed any support, be, you know, being a single mom, you know, if I needed therapy, things like that. But it turns out they genuinely believed that I was going to do it to my kid. And my daughter was two years old at the time. I had never shared this information with like how it actually happened with any professional. They, they never asked. So when I had the surgery, a few days later, I got a knock on my door. This woman comes in and she introduces herself and she explained that my daughter could be at risk of having FGM. And I said, how did you figure that? And she goes, because you have it. I said, so? I said, why would you think that I'm going to do it to my child? Because I have it, I, I, it happened to me. She goes, yeah, because his mother's doing it to their daughters. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I said, I get that. But what makes you think that I will? So she goes, right there and then. Okay, tell me what happened. What? <laughs> and I said, I don't feel comfortable. I said, visibly shaken. I was never put in that position ever. And I said, I can't. Like, I genuinely will break down and will have the most horrible day ever. She said, well, if you don't, <laughs> then um, I'm going to have to like, keep the case open. So I was like, you know what, fuck this. Let me say it, okay? Let me, so I told her, whilst in tears, whilst fucking mumbling over my words, because it was the first time I ever expressed something like that to a physical person that wasn't a close, close, close friend of mine. I felt like shit. So when I finished telling her the story again, it wasn't, what can we do for you? 
Do you need therapy? Do you need counseling? Do you need um, a medical examination? Do you need surgery? Do you need construction, defibrillation? I didn't even know what none of those was. So she, just before she left, she was like, oh, I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to check your fridge, your cupboards, your daughter's room. I was like, was I planning on doing FGM in the house? And she goes, no, 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 because we need to make sure your child is well protected, well fed. And I'm like, okay, just earlier you were saying my child is at risk of FGC. And now you're saying you're going to come and look at my cupboards. What do you think you're going to find there? What do you think you're going to find in my daughter's room? Neglect? Hunger? You know, why am I all of a sudden being attacked like this? And then uh, she goes, well, if you don't share, um, then they're going to put me on a travel ban. They created a database to put historical cases of FGM. So what then happens is all these women who've had historical FGMs were on this database. I, I was told that it no longer exists, only in the past few years. But they used to put them in the database and then tra- put them on a travel ban so they could not leave the country with their daughters. I'm sorry, but what other country receives that? Because I guarantee you FGM is not unique to Somalians. It is not unique to Sierra Leone. It is not unique to the continent of Africa. So what does a FGM or FGC victim look like? But when you see it, you're just going to put them on a travel ban. Is it a specific people that you're putting on a travel ban? Or now there's something that they're trying to do where if they do take the kids out, when the child returns back to the UK, they will be physically examined at an airport. So you are not educating these people in any way, shape or form. You are not doing group uh, sessions. You are not, you know, uh, you know, the countries that you know that are still practicing. 30 countries around the world still practice it. More, actually. Uh, it's not illegal. So you're not educating. You're not providing any service of any kind. You're not helping, but you are re-victimizing. You're speaking to them in the worst way. I have I have never been spoken to like that ever by a professional. And I thought only because they found out about the FGM, shit changed. And I was then, from that point on, I was a criminal. But they did not know about the hatred that I have for that practice. And I can understand it just a tiny bit. I can, I get it. I get why she was sent over to make sure that my child's not at risk. It was for the safety of my child. I get that. But what you are doing is you are completely ignoring me, my needs. So when she left that day, she contacted the police. She contacted my child's nursery. She contacted my workplace. She contacted anything and everything, my GP, that had possible contact with me and my child. Everything came back clear. I am a great mother and I'm very proud of that um, because I chose not to pass on generational trauma and instead build generational wealth. So when she came back, she was like, oh, you know, everything is fine. Um, I called everyone. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. They don't have that awareness because nobody talks about it. And that's what I love about your story so much. Even though you've went through all of this trauma, you still... After all of that, you went out and looked for that knowledge, whether it be for the FGC or even the religion of Islam. You looked into it and you found out your own answers. Your mom said that if you do come back, you need to make something of yourself, make a difference. And what I want to know is how are you doing this? Are you bringing any awareness to FGC, what, what are you doing? Um, I do quite a lot now. Uh, like I said, my mom died in 2012 and I had to deal with homelessness. I had to deal with mental health problems. I was very negative and I lived and breathed negativity. I thought my world was going to fall apart anytime soon. I was waiting for problems to occur. But then I thought to myself, no, I came across a video that said, it was unforgiveness and I couldn't ever comprehend ever forgiving any of those people that subjected me to the, um, the cruel treatment that I received. And what he said is, if you are a sinner, right, we're all sinners. We live in this world. If you believe in a higher power, you also believe that one day you'll be judged for your sins, the sins that you've committed on this planet. So he said, if we cannot forgive our fellow 
brothers and sisters, then how do we expect to stand in front of God and ask him for mercy and forgiveness when we are not willing to show that to our brothers and sisters? And at that moment, I didn't look at them as perpetrators. They are perpetrators, but they're also, as a world, we are a world of brothers and sisters. Whether you're Christian, Jewish, it doesn't matter. You're brothers and sisters. We came from one woman and one man, you know? It depends if, you know, people that believe in Adam and Eve, (laughs) you know, the first people on earth. So we all came from one. And it was so powerful. Although I don't, everybody sins, but I don't think my sins are severe than theirs because of what they did to me. But nevertheless, it's a sin. So I made the decision then not to give them any more power than they already took from me. So I forgave them, each and every one of them, because that's me taking my power back, taking control back and understanding that now that you've let go, once you forgive, you automatically let go, right? The, the traumatic spirit still stays with you, but that hatred and the negativity that was dragging me down, I'm no longer with them, but that's all I could think about. But once I forget, I knew that if they stood in front of God, God might not be as merciful. But because I forgave, I know that if I go in front of God, that I am able to, I know that he will have mercy on me. I know that he will forgive me for my sins because my sins were never like that. (laughs) I don't know what that, that's just, that's atrocity. I don't know what that was. That was crime against humanity. That's what that was. So Shamsa, I'd like to ask you one last question before we come to an end. What do you think listeners and assuming our listeners could be in any kind of professional, any place in the world, what do you think our listeners can do from here on out to make the changes the world needs for women in these situations I or for this culture? I think they need to, one, learn to sympathize. Because if you're not sympathizing, you're not going to offer anything. You have, If you don't have any sympathy or compassion, then you're not going to do anything for that person because you can't relate in any way. They're very different to you. They're from a different culture that you might not agree with what they do. But to completely remove culture and put that aside and think of the patient, that is the job of people that look after vulnerable adults. That is your job, to focus on their individual needs, not focus on their culture, not focus on what they're going to do and what they won't do. And that's not your business. Your business as a doctor, as a nurse, as a teacher is to safeguard that person. And if they did their jobs effectively, then I would not be sat here. Realistically, I don't think I would be sat here advocating as hard as I am if I received the help and treatment, but because I know that I was neglected, I know that they are too. And they're just suffering in silence. So compassion, they need a person-centered care designed for them. We are not all the same. We are survivors of the same practice, yes, but no two practices are exactly the same. No two procedures are exactly identical. So each and every person has to have person-centered care depending on the requirements and needs of that particular person. The questions of, are you going to do it to your child? Is this going to happen again? All of that can wait once you gave that person the treatment that they require. Because once you give them the treatment they require, whether that is therapy, whether that is defibrillation, whether that is reconstruction surgery, whether it's just having a space or a place where they can express the way that they feel, just from interacting with them, you will be able to see whether they pose any risks to their children. But if you're not helping and all you're doing is judging and thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm trying to be culturally sensitive. Fuck being culturally sensitive. Help these women. Help them in understanding, educating, um, so that they are able to go back to their families and educate them. And then their family members would educate the ones back home. And they would say, at least one bloodline would have stopped completely. 
performing it on their children, <laughs> children and so on and so forth. So now I decided to, to answer your question earlier. <laughs> I am a student of policing and criminal investigation because I live and breathe justice and I've had enough. Um, and I want to become the first Somali woman to create a formal justice system for Somalia because it doesn't exist uh, if they don't kill me. But I'm forcing them to love me. It's not a debate anymore. You're going to love me and protect me whether you like it or not. I am <laughs> starting my own charity and it's called Garden of Peace. Uh, my mother's name is Guinea and her name in Hebrew means my garden. So and since she was my garden of peace, I thought it was only fair that I call my charity the uh, Garden of Peace. And it's a place where I want to inspire young women to start planting their seed of healing in our shared garden. And if you plant a seed now, it doesn't matter whether it's a fruit or a vegetable or a flower, it will take time for that flower or plant or fruit to grow. It will not happen overnight. So that in itself is a journey of healing. So they will, they know that it's not going to happen overnight, but I want them to understand that it is a journey. But each stage of the growth will only benefit that particular person until they bloom, until they no longer crave su that support or that. Um, so they can just be free, be passionate, be, you know, find a great job. You know, find your passion, find your uh, your hobby, love to, I don't know, people, some people might love to travel, some people might just inspire and build a sisterhood where you can find services directly through us rather than going to send you from here to here to here to here to here. No. Are you, um, yes, are you looking for volunteers? Oh, okay, that's. That's great because we will definitely put that into the description so our listeners can also, you know, tune in, log in, contact you as well if they would like to volunteer and maybe be a part of this community as well, this charity. That would be super great. Jamza, thank you so much for today. You have been such an inspiration. Very inspiring story. Thank you so much, Jamza. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Shamza runs her own charity called The Garden of Peace, where she raises awareness and sparks conversations around FGM. If you would like to reach out to her or help support her work, you can find the links in the description provided. I'd like to recognize our guests who are vulnerable and courageous enough to share their life experiences with the rest of the world. We really appreciate your perspective. Thank you for showing us that we're human. We'd also like to give a special thanks to our producer, videographer, sound engineer, and everything else in between, Joe Mills. The show would be nothing without you. This is Joseph. This is Jenica. And we, we are multi-spectative. Multi